Today is a, a very big day. We're going to be giving a shear now in honor of Reb Noach Weinberg, Zetzal, Zechot Sadik Vekodesh Livracha, the a blessed memory, the great Rosh Shiva of Eishat Taira, and it's a, it's an amazing thing because everything that we have here, everything that you see, is because of him. It's because that there was somebody that believed so much in saving the entire Klal Yisrael, and saving really all of humanity. There was a line that I always remember that he would speak about it, bringing sanity back to the world. The world's going crazy. And uh, that, you know, that was already 11 years ago, so how much, 12, how much crazier are we, are we now? There's a certain amount of sanity that the Torah has to give us. And Reb Nayak had a certain way of seeing the world with utter clarity. And I want to just begin by saying I was very moved by something that Rav Yehuda Weinberg just said downstairs at the banquet. Rabbi Yehuda was Rav Nayak, is Rav Nayak's son. The one who was speaking downstairs, if you remember, was Rav Nayak's son, is Rav Nayak's son, and has been very much responsible for helping to build up the entire kingdom of, of Torah and to carry on that legacy of teaching the wisdom of Torah to the world. And is very passionate about, about, about his father's Torahs. And he said downstairs right now that Rav Noyach, when he made Eish Torah, so one of the things that was very important to him is that it should be a home. That it should be a home here. Now I remember I got here about 15 years ago, uh, 16, and when I got here it was very interesting, like uh, I come from an old world where people used to backpack around the world. Nowadays like you don't do that stuff anymore. That's like, that already started, I was the last of that generation. There's still a few Yechide Segula, a few people here and there that put on backpacks and go for a hike around the, you know, around the world, but it's a very, it's like a dying breed. But my generation was really, Rabbi Dov Bear and I were the mamish last of that, of that era. So about 17 years ago, when I came on my first trip, so with that, that's basically what it was. We came here, Rabbi Dov Bear was mamish, trekking across the world, and I remember coming to the yeshiva, and I remember this feeling when I got here. I'll just explain this, and I'll come back to some of the other feelings I had. There was a certain feeling, at that point I was staying in, staying in the Shuk, one of the hostels, and uh, I was at the Kotel and I got tapped on the shoulder, of course, by Ramir Schuster, and uh, he said, are you a Jew? I said, yes. He said, so you should be in Yeshiva. So I said, what's Yeshiva? <laughs> so he said, okay, come with me. Now you would imagine somebody with a long white beard and a black hat and it was like a towering six foot three figure would be kind of a scary human being to just come over and you say like, come to yeshiva, follow me. Isn't that everything your parents told you not to do when somebody offers you candy? <laughs> Don't follow that man. But for some reason, there was something about it that felt very, very comfortable to me. And I don't know why, I, I personally believe that he had a malach by him, of Schuster, that he walked me up to Eishat Torah. And of course, Rabbi Noach Weinberg and Rav Schuster worked very closely together. They were like a, a team. That Rav, Rav Schuster would be down the Kaisal, sending people up. Rav Noach would also go send people up, come for a class. And I remember I came, and they took me to the Heritage House. This is a much longer story. This is just like the two-minute version. And I got to the Heritage House. They said, you know, bring your stuff in. I said, how much does it cost? He said, don't worry about it. It's fine. Just... Really? Where am I? This is crazy here. And some guy was in the kitchen like making uh, macaroni and cheese. Remember the ones where you open up the cheese pack, throw the whole thing in, stir it all up, put some ketchup on there that's like gourmet. And he just like serves me up. He wants some food. Like, How much do I owe you? It's family here. Don't worry about it. What are you talking about? The next morning they say, okay, you got to be up nine o'clock, close the doors. Where are we going? Breakfast. Oh, great. Come to breakfast, of course, down in Mechel Rocha, right here. And then they say after breakfast, like, what are you going to do? Just uh, do nothing all day? Come learn some Torah. 
So I went up to the essentials classroom right there. The, now they call the Ezra's Nashim. And uh, start learning Torah. And there was a feeling, and then I came into the dorms. And I'm thinking to myself, like, like what do I have to do? Is there, like, what's the catch? And then I realized it's a family. When it comes to a family, you're home. It's a home. You're home. There's no conditions. A, a parent doesn't have conditions on their child. There's no, if, if you perform, if you do X, Y, and Z, so then you stay with us. And if not, uh, you know, so you have to leave. There's a feeling of, here's a Yid, and he's wandering, he's looking for things. Here, settle in. Settle in. Let's give you space to find your way home. Of course, it doesn't mean find your way home physically. It means find your way home spiritually. Come home. And I felt that the whole system, the dorms were set up, everything was set up in this way of, you have space here to just find your way home, to, to not be pressured. Just, you have space here. So, this is Rabbi Noyach. One of the famous images, Reb Noach, was beyond, beyond. When I first met him, he was screaming at everybody from the base madrash, screaming at everybody to just wake up because everybody was schluffing. And I mean, he was really screaming, wake up, wake up. I was like, just, I was like, look, what do I do? Oh my goodness, this is scary, this is intense. But I like it, because, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, there's something going on here. There, I, I, yeah, we gotta, it's true. Now, most people don't start backpacking around the world because they re, everything's going fine in their life. They realize there's stuff that's not going right, so you're looking for something. So I was already more awakened, I think. But he was crying out to the world, everyone's sleeping. Everyone's sleeping, we're sleeping our world away. Hayyim the Kachom was schluffing away. And I remember arriving here, and number one, feeling that feeling of that everything was set up with this feeling of home and family, but also this feeling of immediacy. And we have to do something now. Reb Noyach's belief was if you know Aleph, teach Aleph. You heard that before? Some people say if you know Aleph and Bays, teach Aleph. You have to be holding a little bit more than. Rav Nash said, you know, Aleph, you teach Aleph because the world is, is dying, the world is drowning. He would speak about a spiritual holocaust happening, and it's only increasing in its intensity right now in the world, Hashem Yirachim. Like the Rosh Hashiva mentioned, that the majority of Yidin do not even know that they were created. They don't even identify with the values of Hashem. And Reb Naich would always say, if a father has a child who's drowning, would the father not give you anything to help that his son should be saved? So Reb Naich would say that we have everything. He'll give you the life test. He'll give you everything you need. The child is drowning. Just go save him. Oh, you don't have resources? You don't have millions of dollars? Did you hear the way they're <coughs> speaking right now? Oh, it's going to cost us 10, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. I was like, hundreds of millions of dollars? Yeah, we have to save the world here. You don't think the father of Yenish is going to help us? So Rabbi Noach thought like this, and he would just, what's the project? How much does it cost? It doesn't matter. Our father's going to pay for it. Now, you have to be really big to do that. And you have to be willing to fail also. Rabbi Noach failed a lot. By failed, you mean that he started things and they, uh, and they didn't go forward. Okay, fine, that's called failure. But look what happened in the end. You know that Rabbi Noach could have been one of the G'day <coughs> He was one of the G'day Le'ador. The G'day Le'manish. I mean the classic G'day Le'ador. Just sitting, learning, keeping all of Klan Lisa on the shoulders. And he was that. Rabbi Noach s- slept very little. I think about three hours a day. An hour at night, an hour towards the morning, another hour sometime. Very little. He did, he did kind of wild things to stay up and learn Torah. Like standing on tables, on chairs on tables, because if you fall asleep, then it's sakana. <laughs> you know, your feet in, in ice and cold water. Like things from the old time, the old country. Nowadays, everything's like, if I don't have five different dipping sauces 
and you know, you know, I, I, where my where I'm about to have night seder with my uh, my burgers bar, it's not, it's not, it's not happening. Reb Nayak was an old generation. It was an old thing. But I want to speak today about what time do we have till four or four fifteen? Anybody know? Four ten. Four ten. It's just a few minutes. About one of the forty-eight ways. Now, when I say forty-eight ways, what does that mean? Reb Nayak popularized a Mishnah. It's really a brisa in the end of Pirkei Avos. The Brisa says that there's 48 ways to acquire the Torah. The Memtes, the Memches, 48 is the 48. The 48 ways to acquire the Torah. And then it goes through the different ways. And you could read it and not even pay any attention to it. Now, Reb Nayak would say, we spend our entire day learning Torah. Everything is about Torah. What do we do all day? We're, we're grabbing onto the wisdom of Hashem, which is the Torah. And the Torah itself tells you there's ways, if you want me, to acquire me. Would it not make sense to elaborate and know these 48 ways? If there's a formula that you're only going to have these 48 ways, if you do X, Y, and Z, you know, you only have the Torah, if you do these 48, would we not really try to work on these 48 ways? So Rabbi Noyer saw this as life itself, and he told also spoke about Torah Chayim, Torah practical, Torah for life. Everything was about making it alive for you now. And he took these 48 ways and he basically exploded them. And every single way, which is one word each, became like a week long of classes on a single word. They wrote a book, Rav Cooper Smith wrote a book, a beautiful book, 48 Ways. It's beautifully written, very nice practical tips for guys. And Reb Noyach took these and just, and just took them out to the world and said, if we want Torah, then we need to know these ways. I want to focus on way number 39. Way number 39, I'm going to ask two main questions on this way. Way number 39 is called Noy Seba Oil Im Chaveroi. Noy Seba Oil Im Chaveroi means to feel to carry your burden with your fellow, to feel for your fellow. That's the way that you acquire Torah by feeling for your fellow. Now, the first question I have is, we call this sheer, why doesn't anybody feel anymore? Now, you might say that that's not such a good, it's not such an accurate title because I feel all the time. I feel when, when my sports team loses, and when my fantasy you know, is going like this, and when I'm losing my, my gambling, or when I want to gamble, then I really feel good. And when I made a good business deal, wow, I feel so excited. And when I watch a movie, I get so into it, I feel. So why are you suggesting, Rabbi, that why don't people feel anymore? I do feel, I do feel. I feel dopamine coursing through my head, just scrolling down my phone. I feel that. So maybe the title is inaccurate, that people do feel. That's question number one. And we're going to see that's not the feeling that we're talking about. Question number two is a bit obvious, which is, what should it have to do? We said that Hashem says there's 48 ways to acquire the Torah. What should it have anything to do with me feeling for my friend and me getting the Torah? What's the connection of feeling for somebody else and me getting the Torah? There's 48 ways that I could get the Torah. One of them is learn. Okay, that, I get that one. That's pretty straightforward. What's this? You should have mute, shayna, less sleep, more time to learn Torah. Mute tainug, eat less, let, because I'm going to have more time to learn. I'm less involved. What does it have to do with spend time feeling for other people? What does that have to do with me getting the title? Maybe to the contrary, to the more that I spend time trying to help Yenim, somebody else, I have less time for me learning Torah. So how could the Torah itself say that by me feeling for somebody else, that's going to help me get the Torah? That's question number two. I want to begin with Moshe Rabbeinu. That the Pesach says about Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, that you know, where did Moses, where did Moses grow up? Moshe Rabbeinu, 
Did he grow up in a, in a house of a tzaddik, in a religious home with from parents? I mean, he did have from parents. He grew up in the house of Paray. You know, he grew up on the lap of Paray. On the lap of Paray. And he would take Paro's crown off his head and put it on his head. And they said, maybe he's the one. You know, you're so worried about someone taking over, the Moshia Shelly, so maybe he's the one. No, I can't. By the way, that shows you the miracle of what was happening there. An unbelievable thing. That somehow that, that Moshe Rabbeinu went under the radar. They're throwing all the babies into the river. The one that's on his lap taking off the crown. And by the way, where did they throw him? Where did they put Moshe to save him? In the river. Could you think of any worse place to try? I'm sure there were cops lining the banks of the river that were looking for crying babies to just push into the river. They were trying to find any single child that was a boy and throw them into the river to kill them. Because maybe that was the Moshia Shelly so maybe that was the Savior. That just shows you the miracle that Hashem runs everything. Hashem runs the world. I would have put a, I would have hid the baby in the desert, take him far away. No, they put him exactly where everybody's looking. Let's see Myers Kasha, he has it. So Moshe Rabbeinu grows up in Pharaoh's house. And then something happens. And Moshe grows up. And he goes out to his brothers. And he sees their pain. He sees. What do you have to do with them, Moshe Rabbeinu? You grew up in the house of Pari. You're, you're royal. What does it have to do with, with them? It's true, you are a Jew. But they're not like you. They're not like you. And he saw an ish mitzri make, ish ivri me'echov. And he saw something not nice that was happening. It says Rashi, biyar v'siv loisam. What did he see? It says Rashi. Nosan e'ne v'libay liyais meitzar aleim. He put his eyes to feel. He wanted to feel them. He leaned into their pain. He, he got under the pain with them. He, he became involved with them in that pain. It wasn't something from afar. It was, I'm with you. Now, by the way, what does it mean? What does even those words mean? Does it mean to feel for my friend? What does it actually mean if we translate those words? Noise means to carry. Like in the suin, when you get married, you're, you're carrying. You're going to tell your wife, I'm going to carry you through everything. I'm going to take care of you, no matter what happens. Noise the oil. An oil is a burden. It's something that's a yoke. Which means, let's say you see your friend and he's got a burden on his shoulders. What does it mean to be noise the oil in chavera? It means I don't just see him and feel bad for him. I go under the yoke with him. I want to be so much with you that I feel you. I feel you. I feel like we've become one. I feel that we're unifying together to such a degree that in a certain way, I don't know where I end and you begin and you end and I begin. We've become bonded, we've become unified. Chavero also means to bond and to unify. When I go under that O, I become one with that person. When Klal Yisrael came to Har Sinai, to get the Torah, the Rashiva mentioned it today. Ve'ichan sham Yisrael neged ahar ki ish echad b'leiv echad. That we got to the we got to Mount Sinai, and it says that we encamped there. We encamped there as one person. How is it one person? We're six hundred thousand. That means that we became one person. Ki ish echad b'leiv echad. Not one person, like, you know. Unified together, 
a joint purpose, a joint goal. We became so intimately connected to each other, underneath the same all together, completely bonded, like one person, that I don't know where you end and I begin, to such a degree. The Yushalmi, where Shiva also mentioned it today, famous Yushalmi, that there was a butcher that was cutting meat, and the butcher came down and he started to cut, and he cut off his hand. So you know what happened? The next day, what did the butcher want to do? He took the knife to cut off his other hand. I'm going to get revenge on you. You cut off my hand. Is it ludicrous? Why? Oh. It's all you. What do you mean? The, this hand and this hand. Say the Ushami. First one wants to take revenge on another Yid. It's all you. You are one person. Klali so where our neshama exists. Is beside Guf Echad. It's all one. There's only one. There's only one here. So you're going to take revenge on another guy? One of the most challenging things to do is really feel with somebody, to be with them in a real, real way. It's very difficult. Why? Because I'm me and you're you. When we talked about feeling, why doesn't anybody feel anymore? We meant at the beginning that we do feel. You, something external makes me feel something. I watch a video, it's funny. I, uh, I see this happen, it's happening to me. I get my business goes up, it was external stimulating me. That's not the feeling we're talking about, we feel those things all the time. You go on a roller coaster, I feel, wow, it was exhilarating. It was still something from the outside affecting me. The feeling we're talking about is becoming literally the, the, I go under the yoke, I go under that burden with you. Someone's carrying something, I literally come into that place with you. I sit with you and I'll cry with you. I'll go through what you're going through. In a, in a veilus, when a person loses somebody, so you go and you just sit. You don't even initiate conversation. You just go and you sit with the mourner. You, you don't even say, you're just going to say, I'm with you. I'm just with you. I'm so with you. To really be nice in oil chaveirai, to really carry a burden with some is very difficult. Because we come home, we got our agenda. I come home, I'm tired, I'm hungry, what's for dinner, what's going on? I have a certain picture in my mind that the house is gonna be, you know, so neat, and the kids are all gonna be like bathed and washed up, and their hair is gonna be combed nicely, and they're gonna smell nice, and let's give them like that little kiss, good night, as they're just, you know, falling onto the pillow, and my wife is gonna have everything under control, and then you come, you come back, and it's like, a, you know, like a war zone. Like, what happened? So either I could be, what's going on here? I thought it was going to be like this. Or I have to think, oh my goodness. There's no school for the kids. <laughs> Everything's mishugana right now in the world. What's going on? You, you, I'll tell you what's going on. You mamish, you throw down your bag, you dive in there, you pull, get you have a kid over here, throw them in the bath, scrub them up. What, what, dear, dear wife, what do you need? Can I get you something? And by the way, it's not about can I get you something, because then you're not feeling it. I'll tell you, when I first got married, my wife and I went to see a certain tzaddik, and uh, he told us to watch a, a short movie. And he played it in front of us, in his office. You can look it up yourself. It's called, it's not about the nail. Nail, N-A-I-L. I think it's got like 12 billion hits. I might have exaggerated that number, but it's got a lot. It mamish sums up so much of marriage, and so much of just feeling for somebody else, being there for somebody else. Because generally we think to be there means I gotta fix the problem, right? No, maybe you just feeling and being there with them is what they need. To just, when you see somebody, and I want you to think if there's people right now in your life that you know, that are maybe struggling, don't 
necessarily think, what can I do to help you? The first step is, I'm feeling, I'm with you. I'm, 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 I'm with you, I'm, 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 allowing, I'm allowing that pain, I'm allowing that experience to, to be with me. I want to go through it with you. This might be calling somebody and saying, I know you're going through something difficult. I just want, I, I'm here for you. I, I, I'm just here. And is, is, I'm just with you. I'm, I'm just with you. And I'm, I'm trying very hard to just be with you. And that's something, Bezrat Hashem, we got to take time to, to do and work on and think if there's people in your life right now that, that you can feel and you could just feel where they're at. People go through difficult things. People are going through all sorts of challenging things in the world. The world is in a crazy state right now. To just feel for somebody else. So yeah, we do feel things. We seem to feel all sorts of things, but that's generally an external, something that stimulates me. The feeling we're talking about is totally being under that burden with somebody else, going through it with them. I'll go through this with you. The Reb Noyach felt, he felt. When you say somebody is a godl, that he's great, you don't just mean that he's a godl in Torah. To be a godl means you're great in everything. You know, at a funeral, the Sarm say, you can always tell who the family members are because they're crying the most. And then the people that are crying less are the closer relatives, the people that are crying even less are the people that were more on the external and people that are barely not, so they weren't, didn't have much of a connection. But you know, when a guddle, when someone who's really great is at a funeral, he's crying like crazy because he feels so close to every single year. He's not just a guddle in Torah, he's a guddle, he's massive in feeling, in feeling. Now, by the way, when you go to a wedding, who are the people that are dancing the most? The family. Who are the people that are dancing less, less, less? But you come to a chasana, you see a guddle walk in, the big guddle of their mom is going lichtig, because they feel you get engaged, the bigger the person is, they will light up Mazda. It's like, I only met you one time, but you're Hassan. A big person goes nuts. So excited, filled with life. But no, it was so big. When you were with him, there was a feeling of bigness. Very, very big. He felt he was with people. When I first came here, there was a feeling like I was so attracted to the bigness of everything that I saw somebody that who spoke in the following way. If somebody could exterminate and kill six million, then we have to learn to save six million. And he lived with that. He was breathing that. He was very close to Shach, who also had these ideas. We need to mamish save the whole world. And he said, of course, Hashem is going to help us. He's on our side. He's on our side. Is the father not going to help somebody who's drowning? His own son, of course. He'll give you all the resources you need. So you have to know that going into this, that we're doing the will of Hashem. And Nur felt it. He was so with people. He was so there. And he would scream. The feeling of what it was like when he was here was that you felt like you had a general of an army that was mobilizing troops to save the world. He was an ultimate organized, I remember business, everything was breakout, okay? Come back with 10 ideas how to save the Jewish people. The teams would all come back, they would say the ideas that I thought of all your ideas and I have another 50 ideas. You guys are not thinking enough, you're not, you're not big enough. He pushed people to really feel, I wanna read you, for his last will and testimony. I remember right after the, right after the funeral that uh, 
that they printed, it looks like this, Last Will and Testament. This is like the small version of it. They were passed around. They're probably still around. They came out uh, after he passed away. And I remember reading, like a person's will, te Testament, what they want to leave to the world summed up in the most concise language. I remember reading this. I'd only been here a few years. And I remember reading this and just being very, very moved by what was really going on here of someone who totally felt for the whole world. And he said the following, to my children, this is Reb Noyach Rebbe, to my children, my students, and the contributors who in any way contributed to Aisha Torah's cause, I instruct, implore, and advise each and every one of you to spend 10 minutes every night to first focus on the terrible profanation of Hashem's name and the fact that a majority of the Jewish people deny the validity of Judaism and are charged of being a light to the world. Do you understand what he just said? To spend 10 minutes every night feeling that Hashem's name is being profaned in the world, that people deny Hashem's existence are doing things against the Torah and His will. The feeling, not only for Noise Ba'olim Chaveray, for human beings, but this extends to feeling the pain of the Shechina. That in a certain way, Kaviyachal, that a person could feel that Hashem Himself, Kaviyachal, is in pain. How could it be that we're not yet back? How could it be? And the feeling of that pain is, I'm joining. It's interesting, when we're talking about feeling, we're talking about feelings that unify. That's the secret that's happening now. When I feel for you, there's a unifying happening. So a person who feels for Hashem, there's a unifying with Hashem. A person who's feeling. When you really feel for somebody, there's a deep bond. You're bonding, you're joining together with them. The, the lines are blurring. You're under the, the burden with them. We're in this together. More than this together, we are going through this together. We're, we're really one. And Abnayak said, before you go to bed, to think about this. Secondly, to focus on the pain of our Creator. The subsequent pain of mankind. Look how much pain the human the humanity is going through in the world. The pain. How many people can truly say that they're living deeply happy, fulfilling lives right now? If you really ask them, get past the you know the Facebook uh, facade and, and and all those images that you post. Get to the real human being. It's hard now to have face to face conversations with people. But have a face-to-face -face conversation and really say, how are you doing? How many people could really say, I'm feeling vibrant and alive and, and, and uplifted and everything is great? The humanity is in a time of tremendous pain. And to feel that, to feel that, this is his last will and testament. He could have said many, many things. There's an underlying message of feeling really allowing yourself to get out of yourself and, and become much bigger. And to think what you can personally do about this problem. I instruct, implore, and advise all those, all those who are thankful for what Aisha Torah has done to, for them and those who respect my judgment to do whatever they can to help Aisha Torah fulfill its mission of bringing home to our Creator His children, wherever they may be. That summed up every single thing that Adnayat believed in. And now we can better understand why this is one of the 48 ways. Because when I talk about feeling, it's not just something external affecting me. Feeling means I start unifying with other people. The Maral says the Torah could only be given by the God who is one to a nation who is one. You can't have one giving to the many. One sticks to one. So Kalal Yisra had to be unified. We had to have this feeling, this unification, this consciousness at Harasina. 
So you're going to try to get the Torah, but you're not feeling for other people? You're not getting the real Torah. Yeah, yeah, no, I got my Torah. I, I, I go into my uh, ivory place chamber. I don't really involve myself with other people. No, no, okay, well, I'm, I'll be nice. I'm not just saying, if you're not in the, in the profession of feeling for people, I would have to close my Gemara more and have to spend less time in the base measures. Yeah, because that's the only way to get the real Tyra. Besides the fact that is the mission, is to feel, look where time could have said, I instruct and implore everybody to learn 27 hours of Gemara a day and to make sure to do this. And that. he said the majority of this is just start to become unified with Hashem. Be under that yoke, so to speak, with Hashem and under the yoke of, huma- of hu- uh, all of humanity. And we should be zoicha. To be nice to the oil of Chavera, to really, really feel the oil of Chavera. Hashem is also called our Chavera. And that the legacy of Rabbi Noyach, Zecher Tzadik, the Kaddish Livracha, should live on forever. We're living. You could feel everything about Rabbi Noyach is in. It's here. It's coursing through this place. That we're here to save the world and bring back the wisdom of Hashem's Torah to all of humanity and to help guide humanity towards fulfillment and happiness and growth and relationships and health. And we're davening, we're asking the Rosh Shiva and Shemayim to be a Melitz Yosher and to beseech Hashem on our behalf because where the Rosh Shiva is right now, he can do things that are difficult for us to do. We're asking the Rosh Shiva to storm the heavens. Mamish, you should know it took us so long to get that building. It was like decades of paperwork. I'm, I'm not kidding. Reb was Nifter. Within six months, this thing went through, that thing went through, this thing went through. I remember we were both, we were all like sweeping the floors and scrubbing the things down, and then these things are coming in from Italy. The whole building just went chick chak. Because Rabbi is in Shemaim, he's, he's turning over Shemaim to get that building up and running. Once you're in Shemaim, you can make moves. There's different things that are happening. So the Rosh Hashiva should be a Melitz Yosher, should Mamish help to daven to our Kodesh Baruch Hu, that we should have the Koyches, that we should c- continue on the path to be Mekadi Shem Shemaim. And Bezrat Hashem to really feel for all of our brethren, brothers and sisters, and all of humanity. And Bezrat Hashem with this, Shvi Ilui Nishmas, Rabbi Yisrael Noyach, Ben Rabbi Yitzchak Matziau. We should see the Gula Shem Shleima Meshut Zidkain Ben Heir of Yemenu. Amen. Amen. Shkoyach.